as always, I'm joined on our spiritual journey with my co-producer and my co-host, the Reverend James Bell, who doesn't like to be called that, but we'll call him Jim. Jim. Just Jim. Just plain Jim. Right. He is the pastor of the Village Church, and he's going to introduce our special guest. Well, I think we do have a really special guest this morning, uh, John Lee. Uh, John and his wife, uh, Marie, have lived at Village uh, at Greenspring Village now for about 13 months. They moved here from Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, John is a retired uh, from the Department of Agriculture and from there went over to teach uh, economics at uh, uh, Mississippi State until he retired also from there. Um, John, John and Marie are United Methodists. Uh, they're members of the Village Church, and since they've been here, become active in almost everything. And the book you just held up, Born Rich in a Time That Has Gone Forever, is a book that John has written about his youth. Uh, he's also uh, donating one of those books, which will be in our, one of our ra raffles at the Diversity Fair in July. Um, and my, my connection with John has been pretty firm over these last 13 months. Uh, because he has a great interest in his faith and social justice. And so, John, welcome, and I really thank you for agreeing to come on. Thank you, Jim and Diane. I appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to it. So, you want to get started, Jim? Well, I guess the, fir I guess the first thing is to ask you the role of faith from youth. Just how, how has faith played a part in who you are? I think it's played a very important part. And I got a good foundation when I was growing up in a family that uh, sort of lived the faith. <clears throat> they didn't try to be overly holy or religious. They just tried to live the good Christian life, uh, especially my mother, but my dad too. In fact, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to read you a, a little paragraph in my book that I wrote for my, about my mother, really about both my parents. And I talk about being born rich, but it wasn't money. We just, in fact, we were very, in worldly goods, very poor then. But I say, the greater part of my wealth is I have never had to wonder if I am loved. This is a source of wealth more overwhelming than I can describe. It starts with my parents. They were full of life, adventure, and gratitude for everything. My father never wavered, even though we didn't have any money much in providing my three brothers and me with anything we really needed. He also taught us the value of what we already had. My mother was wise beyond her schooling. In a loving way, she set high standards and expectations for us, but her expectations were never about money, prestige, or power. They were about loving, caring, and human decency. And I think that's where I got my interest in, uh, in social justice. How did she do this? She did it by being who and what she was, such that we loved her so much, the pain of disappointing her would be too great to bear. I know that my shortcomings have inflicted some pain on her, but if my mother was ever disappointed, she never showed it. She could be honest about not liking something her boys did, but her love for us and for everyone was unconditional and non-judgmental. By her life, she also taught me that love is not object or person oriented, but a state of being. The real wealth here is not that my mother and father loved me and my brothers, but that they were loving people. And that was, that's a strong foundation. And my mother always said, um, she was trying to be non-judgmental and she generally wasn't. She was always the open person that if there was any conflict among neighbors or conflict in the family, they could always go to my mother, both sides. <laughs> and uh, so uh, she was always open arms, welcoming, unconditional love. She lived to be 101. When she was 95, she published a little bit of book called Recollections and, uh, and Recipes. And the book is called Fried Chicken on Sunday. <laughs> because in our little Methodist church, the uh, uh, ministers were circuit ministers who had several churches and those one or two days in the month when they got to our church it was always who's going to take the preacher <laughs> to lunch to di dinner we called it then midday and that was quite an honor so everybody vied to be able to take the minister to lunch 
I always knew the minister was coming to lunch when early in the morning before we even started to go to church. I could smell fried chicken cooking in the, in the uh, kitchen. And it seemed that, uh, I don't know whether it was because Methodist preachers really love fried chicken <laughs> or whether it was just, that was the, uh, the best, most luxurious meal we could afford. But it was, anyway, it was a great life. And great back life. then, chicken was a, um, wasn't, quote, cheap or economical oh, no. to buy. It was We had chickens on the farm, right. yes. We grew up with chickens, and um, we ate them when we, when we had to, but we didn't have a lot of other meat. You're right. I, I noticed one of her recipes was banana pudding. That, <laughs> that also had to be a favorite. <laughs> uh, some great recipes in there, yes. Um, well, I, I, I'm struck by when you talk about love and unconditional love, because in Greek the word would be agape. Yes. And um, that's something my father has um, preached to us kids in, in saying that it's the most important thing you can achieve. And it's pretty hard to have that unconditional love, especially when you do disappoint. That's right. And, and yes. sometimes as a mom, I do play the guilt card, so I shouldn't do that to my kids, huh? <laughs> my mother never did that. My mother would, she was capable of punishing us with a little, little switch from the peach tree in those days, but she never did it in anger. Uh, in fact, she would wait until she calmed down if she got mad about something and would punish it. And she always said, it hurts me more than it hurts you. I never understood that. <laughs> <laughs> and my brother Jimmy would always say, no, that's not right, Mama. <laughs> oh, I had a wonderful brother. Uh, two of us, I'm the oldest, my brother Jimmy, um, were very close, only 14 months apart. Uh, and then there was a skip of about 10 years and two more brothers close together. So we grew up like two pairs, but we all were very close. And uh, I lost my brother, Jimmy, when he was only 49 with cancer. A very, a very Christian man, a very, um, he's an attorney, but committed to using his training, his attorney, to solving problems. When I moved to Tuscaloosa, Marie and I moved back to Tuscaloosa in 2000, year 2001. I kept running into people. I said, did you know my, well, I didn't ask them, Sooner or later, they would say, Lee, are you kin to Jimmy Lee? I said, that was my brother. He said, oh, you're my friend. He said, uh, let me tell you what Jimmy Lee did for me. One man said he, he was talked out of a divorce, and he and his wife have been close ever since then. Uh, another one said, uh, my family was sick out here, and no one would come in and do something for us. Jimmy showed up, and he did this. And on and on and on. Even the county commissioner, I was trying to get something done in our neighborhood. He was very obstinate. He wouldn't, uh, we can't afford to do that. We can't fix those pipes. We can't do this. One day he figured out, he said, are you any kin to Jimmy Lee? I said, that's my brother. He said, what do you need? <laughs> and so uh, he was a loving person. And one example of that was when integration came to Tuscaloosa County, Alabama, in the 1960s, and his court ordered integration, there were angry white people who didn't want integration. And they were riled up and they were yelling and hooping and going on. And there was a big school meeting because the next school started uh, the next week. And people said, no way, you know, we're not going to school. We're not going to go to school with black people and all this. Finally, when all the hullabaloo was going on, my brother stood up and he said, he told him why he appreciated the concept of public schools and why that was so important to America and why it was important that we move on, that we love each other with brotherly love. And he said, when school starts Monday morning, my little girl would be there, my daughter would be there. And sure enough, she was the only white, she was six years old, the only white kid in school. But others began to see that and come back. Mm -hmm. I always appreciated that very much. I, I, I was gonna say just myself, having grown up in the South, being a social justice mindset uh, and connecting with Christian faith, that, that's very difficult at times in the South because the South, the, South the South avoided it uh, in the church. You know, we used to have black choirs come sing during race relations week, but that was about it. Uh, so it must have been difficult to be on the side of social justice and... It was. Uh and not as much so today, right. but 
Um, it was very tough then, and you had to be careful because even your best friends would desert you if you said the wrong thing at the wrong time. But um, my brother ran for the legislature, and he was elected in a predominantly black district. Mm -hmm. That shows how much connection he had with people there. So, so do you think this um, aspect of social justice came from your parents? In, in, in terms, and, and if so, how was that um, demonstrated? It, I think the foundation for my parents was this whole concept of love. You know, love not just your family, but love and respect to other people. Understand them before you're critical of them. Uh, my mother always quoted, you know, walk in someone else's shoes before you're critical. And she tried to be that way. <clears throat> I think I had the good fortune of having a variety of experiences in life. I went to school at Auburn. I went into the Army for a couple of years, uh, got a master's degree at Auburn, then went off to Massachusetts for a PhD. And that exposed me to a whole set of uh, thinking that was so different than growing up. And that made me really appreciate um, not that you've got to get out of your comfort zone. You've got to get out and understand uh, how other people think about things. There was a little church in Vermont. My wife and I would drive up to Vermont on the weekend sometimes in school when we could afford a gallon of gas. <laughs> and there was a little church there that said, where all think alike, none think at all. And I wish I remember that, never forgot that. You gotta have a diversity of thought that makes you think about other things. So out of a variety of experiences I've been very fortunate to have, I've been a very fortunate person uh, in my life. I've more and more become used to examining my own thinking about things. Um, and, and the church is thinking about things. So much so that <clears throat> um, I've come to have more appreciation for the core value of Christianity. And I don't worry too much about Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian. I just, I don't identify, I don't have a label that says Methodist. Uh, or even Christian for that matter, but I live the Christian values. Pay attention to what Jesus actually said and don't worry about other contradictions and other part of the religious life, that sort of thing. So I have to say, and I don't mean to offend anyone, that I'm more focused on core values, including social justice, than uh, I am on some of the rituals and things, even though they're important, and some people they're very important, and I respect that. I don't have any question problems with other people having that. For me, I don't get hung up on the de on the details like that. What are the principles that we learn from Jesus' teaching that we should live by? Well, I I think it was Harry Emerson Fostick that made the comment about. One, one role of the of the faith is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Right. So. I've always reminded people in our home church in Tuscaloosa, the Methodist Church there, when people got too comfortable and there was some change, I should reminded them, you know, one of our jobs is to afflict the comfortable. We've got to get out and do some things. Right. We were, that was a good little church in Alabama. It was uh, not the biggest church in Tuscaloosa, but we got involved in a lot of social issues. One of the big projects as I was leaving, and they're still battling this in Alabama, was the payday lending. And feeling, looking at the people who got trapped in debt with payday lending with 300, 400% interest rates and things like that, who really were not educated necessarily, didn't know what they were getting into, and then they were trapped for long, long times. And for those who may not know what that means, just take a moment yes. and explain. Payday that. lending, uh, you see these um, loan shops all around the place, lots of them here. Uh, title loan to get, give a title to your car and you get a loan on it. Or you just go in and get a loan until next payday. And they always tell you, look, you need medicine, you need a uh, doctor's visit, whatever, you, clothes for your kids or whatever. Come in, we'll lend you $100. And, and then on uh, two weeks from now, you pay us the $100 back plus a $25 or something. I don't know what the fees are, but a service fee. And most people, two weeks from now, are no better able to pay it back than they were the day they borrowed right. it. And so then they roll you over into a new loan with a new fee. And six months down the road, you find out instead of owing 
$100, you owe $500, and you've paid a lot of interest. You paid several hundred dollars in fees and interest, and you're sort of trapped. I've always felt that that was highly immoral um, and that it victimizes people. So not to get into that in detail, but I, that's just an example of things we got very much into. So what were you trying to um, prevent? I mean, was it we were to trying go to get us We were trying to work with the state legislature to get an act passed that would limit the interest rates to 36 percent, which sounds like enough, 36 uh, percent a year, and to put some regulations on what they could and couldn't do. And we left a group that is very active still in that. We got a bill almost through the legislature this year. They did. We're not there anymore. And I was proud of them. The little country church I grew up in, it's a little Hebron Methodist church. It's a little tiny church. Been there since 1830s, uh, out on a country road in Alabama. It's a, it's a powerful little church. It's integrated, uh, thanks to some wonderful people who came in and said, well, can we come to church here? And people had the good sense to say yes, and now it's wonderful. It just made a big difference. But that little church, 25 or 30 members, uh, they have a hobo supper every year and they make food and soup, uh, stew, and bottle it in jars and they take it around to needy families. In the heat of the summer, they go buy electric fans and take them around to people uh, who don't have air conditioning. In the winter time, they give a little electric heaters out and hopefully people can pay the electric bill. And they decided to clean up the highway just to make the place more beautiful, take care of God's earth. And they cleaned up about 15 miles of highway four times a year. Wow. And they worked with a local little black church that's near them. And they do some things together now. They've invited each other over to each other's services. But um, neither wanted to fully give up their church. And so they do things together, cleaning up the highways and that sort of thing. But it's a wonderful church. How have um, uh, when you made the comment about not being Methodist uh, uh, in terms of labels, I think that's one of the things going on in this country right now, that more and more people are like you uh, and denominations have not yet caught on to that, that at the local level, like here, we, li we live among many denominations and it hardly matters. What really matters is the way we live our lives here, not, not what denomination we affiliate with. That was a headline or a front page on, um, I don't think it was Time magazine, one of the major news magazines of a young person and it said on there, uh, forget church, just live like Jesus lived. I want to live like Jesus lived. Mm -hmm. Now you can take that too far yeah. because the institutional church does a lot of good, does a lot of things. <clears throat> but I think the church needs to be attuned to people somehow some of the young people reject the doctrinaire uh, kind of institutionalization of religion, in quotes, and want to just try to be good people and to go out and do all kinds of service projects. I, yes, we have to be attuned to that. Do you think that's possible without having some kind of structure, regardless of it's a, if it's a temple I, I, or a church yeah. or a mosque? I think that's a challenge. Somehow, if we could do it within, if we could be more flexible within our structure, many Methodist churches, and I think other churches do it too, now have what they call a, um, uh, my, my goodness, I can't think of the name now, but an informal service along with a regular service. Contemporary service. A, a, con a contemporary service, yes. I know our church did that in Tuscaloosa, and the main, all the main Methodist churches that did that, and they got very large numbers. And though, but they're in the framework of the church. I, but, th yeah. I think the I think the structure helps us in terms of making sure that we're a community and that we operate yeah. as a community and not just scattered. Uh, but hopefully, that structure enables the gathered community to then be the scattered community and do the kinds of things you're talking about, John. I think it's important that people have a structure within which they learn the basics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then later, if you know the basics, then you can critique some things and decide which is more important to you right. and that sort of thing. But if you don't know the basics, you don't know how to critique the whole right. thing. So. Now that, that's something I've always 
thought was important f with my um, children and, and when um, I have young parents who have children and you get to that decision of you know religion and however you're going to deal with it and I always felt the child has to have the structure and then when they're old enough they can figure it out but if they don't have that initial structure of some kind of organized religion whatever that may be they're going to have a harder time trying right. to figure things out. I mean, that, that's just been my personal experience. Yes. Well, changing the subject slightly, in my own life, I guess I always thought this, but never formalized it in my thinking until a number of years ago I had to teach a Sunday school class, and came to appreciate what I call the two Gs grace and gratitude. And those two things are like two sides of the same coin. And I think if you, if you wake up every day or go to bed at night, anyway, even coming close to comprehend grace, God's grace, and the blessings you've had in your life. I mean, I'm here. I could complain about the food or about hauls being too long or whatever. That's just trivial stuff. You know, I'm alive, I'm healthy, I've had a chance to learn, I've had all kinds of opportunities, I have a wonderful wife, I mean, I, good friends, and so I, I'm overwhelmed almost sometimes with all the good things. And if, if you appreciate that, that's the gratitude side. I think the more you're grateful, the more you understand and can comprehend the grace side. And same with the grace. If you comprehend the grace, the more you'd be grateful. And those two things, I think, are just really critical parts of any spiritual journey and, and Christian life. Yeah, I really come to appreciate those. No, and I think that's a good point. Um, there are, um, I don't know who first said this, or I'm sure it's been said over the years, but um, I know when I leave Greenspring, um, I try to come up with five things I'm grateful for, for on my way home. And you're not supposed to say the same things over and over again, right? You know, and, but usually it's like, wow, oh, it was a great day, you know, it's a beautiful day, or, yeah. you know, we didn't, we, we had the power come back on yesterday, <laughs> you know, instead of stay off. Um, that would have been a new one. Um, but, you know, things like that. And I, I think it really does put the day in perspective when oh, you, yeah. when you're kind of, you force yeah. yourself to say five things you're grateful for and don't repeat what you said the day before. I can see, I can hear, I can feel, my fingers all work. I mean, a million things, just a million things that some people don't have. And it doesn't make you better than someone else. It just makes you grateful what you have and feel empathy with the people who have those problems. But you, you and Marie have also been very good about making some friends with folks who are not very mobile and not able to get out a lot. I mean, they, they go visit people every week that would be forgotten here and never said a word about it until I just accidentally found out one time that you all had been to visit and then I found out not only that you were good friends with that person. Yes, um, Marie got me started but we enjoyed actually it's, it's not a burden it's something you enjoy doing once you get to know people when I deliver I deliver church bulletins over there on Sunday to the Garden Ridge <coughs> certain floors they give me and sometimes I say, oh, I want to get this done, you know, maybe if they're asleep, I can just leave it. But then sometimes they awake and I knock on the door and come in. And five minutes later, 10 minutes later when I leave, I realize this person really needed someone to talk to. And, and I said, that person had a fascinating life. And everyone's life is a story. And um, many of those lives, if you listen to them, they're good sermons. Um, and so, we enjoy doing that. Marie, when she came here, first came, she says, I'm going to take it as my mission, two things. One is to visit people who might be lonely. And I said, I'll go with you, we'll do that. And the other was to start a hearing loss support group. She had so many people that have hearing problems, they'll get so frustrated by it. And she said, I'm trying to help those folks live a better life. And anyway, she's good. My wife is good. Very good. <laughs> so how do you, when, if you, when you go to a complete stranger, talk us through a visit for other people who might 
kind of want to do that, but you know, they, they may not know how to approach it. I mean, do you just knock on the door and say hi? In, yeah. in it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. Right. I see the name on the door and I, the name on the boat and I'm just going to visit. And you say, hi, I'm John. May I come in? And I'm a resident here. And how are you doing? You know, you start off. And if they, you can tell whether they want to talk or not. Sometimes people don't want to talk. And then you just you work your way into um, more substantive uh, discussion as you go along. I don't push him on deep subjects and things. Just try to give them someone to relax and talk to. I, I don't find it hard at all. I find it. Some people worry about what do you say and, and how it, you know whatever. Just talk, and you can tell from the body language of what they say whether they want to talk more or don't want to talk more. So I think it's uh, not hard. I think the good thing is that almost everybody we visit over there does want to talk to somebody. There are lots of lonely people. They really are, and they they really appreciate someone to talk to. And, and there are lots of people here who go over and visit too. Uh, there are, yes. One lady in particular we're visiting have been doing it now for a year. Uh, she's come every week. She looks forward to a visit. I'm I'm threatening to. Uh, help her write her life stories, right? And, and oh, good. It would be a lot of fun. So John and Jim, we're getting close to the end of our program, and I know you wanted to share some other things from your book. My prayer life has changed over the years. Ever since I was a little kid, my mother you know, taught us to pray, and long, early as we could make a sentence, we'd be saying our prayers at night. And that can sort of get into a routine, and sometimes you say the same thing over and over again. And then I get off onto all the problems of the world and, and asking God's help with those. Too often I find that um, I was getting a situation where there's some frustrating problem with some person or, or some issue. And I was starting out asking God to help me to, to help solve that issue, God to solve that issue. I soon come around to the notion, okay, God, I'm not responsible for all these other people. What do you want me to do? I learned that lesson from my mother. Bless her. That was a, do we have time? Uh, sure. A couple okay. minutes. My mother, during the civil rights activities in the 1960s, that was the march from Selma to Montgomery. <clears throat> a lot of uh, stuff in the news about some woman from Chicago who had gone down and joined, the white woman who joined the march with the black people, and how uh, they made, how scandalous that was, how terrible that was. My mother was at some club meeting or something, and the ladies were chatting away. That woman should be in Chicago taking care of her kids. And what is she doing down here? She actually was shot and killed, the woman was. And, um, and finally, after all this jabber, 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 they turned to my mother and said, Juanita, what do you think about those people? That woman, that woman. My mother was very quiet for a moment and she said, I've been sitting here thinking that when I come face to face with the great judgment with God, he's gonna look me right into the eyes, right into the soul, my soul and say, Juanita, what did you do? Wow, powerful lesson there. Not what everybody else did, what did I do to make things better? And that has become the focus of my prayers, my meditation. My prayers have become less formal. I meditate more often and try to focus on how should I live my life to be more beneficial to other people. And that's, that's, been, that's been a journey. That sometimes it gets scary when um, you start saying, Lord, I want to know the truth, searching for truth. And the search for truth can be both exciting and sometimes scary, um, when truth may not be what you want to hear. So. John, I'm surely glad that you're making the journey with us at Green Spring. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. We really enjoy the place and we really enjoy the people. And we've come to appreciate how much every life means because to each individual, that's all they have, their own life. Mm -hmm. And that um, is something we have to respect. And we love doing it. Yeah. 
And that's going to do it for this spiritual journey. So we'll be right back after this. Thank you.